I'd like to show you why knowing your why is the start of your journey. Without a strong why, it can be so difficult to reach your maximum potential. My name is Dr. Jason Ballara, and every week I meet with real estate investors and mindset specialists that are taking action in order to build a life according to their own terms. We will break down what drives successful people and allows them to achieve at such a high level. If you are a professional wanting to break through, or simply someone that wants to hear an inspiring story, the Know Your Why podcast is made for you. Hi everyone, I'm Jason Ballar and this is the Know Your Why podcast. Today I'm here with Lee Yoder. Uh, Lee is was a practicing physical therapist. I like that we both have medical backgrounds, so that'll be fun to talk about. Uh, and then realized his true passion was building his own business and investing in real estate. So first of all, Lee, thanks for coming on the show today. Yeah, Jason, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be on. Awesome. Um, well, if you would, would you go ahead and sort of share with us your story, how you got started, your background, all of that, and then um, we'll kind of take it from there. Yeah, sure, Jason. I, I like sharing my story because um, I, you know, I just didn't do anything special. Um, anybody could could do what I did. If you want to get into real estate, if you want to be an entrepreneur. Um, so yeah, I was a physical therapist. Uh, did the outpatient thing, you know, the, the typical outpatient clinic that most people think of when they think of physical therapy. My wife and I were starting our family, so didn't love the schedule because you know had to be there kind of later, so that guys like you and I, Jason, when we get off work, we'll go to therapy. So you know, we had to be there, be open later. So I did home health. Um, and did that for a year. Uh, and, you know, it was awesome for the family. Um, I mean, I got to make my own schedule. Uh, very laid back. I mean, I would just, you know, basically, you're treating older people who can't get to an outpatient clinic. So, you know, I'd go in their house and sit with them for a half an hour, you know, one on one, I mean, just so laid back. Again, very flexible. So it was awesome for my family. Um, unfortunately, fortunately, whatever, like, God just didn't make me for a job like that. So I was just bored out of my mind. I mean, after a year, I was like, I, I can't, I can't do this. I felt like I was on an assembly line, just putting nuts and bolts together or something. Um, so the company I was with, you know, I didn't really know it at the time, but they were actually a startup staffing company. So I was just out in the field doing therapy. Meanwhile, most of the people who worked for the company were in recruiting healthcare people and, and staffing hospitals and things like that. Um, so they eventually asked me to come in and be the clinical director. So I jumped at that opportunity because like, I need, you know, more of a challenge. So I came in, I was doing like half and half, but quickly I got to the point where I was in the office all, all the time doing no physical therapy. So, you know, I'm two years into graduating from a seven year, uh, you know, college program or whatever, spend all this money and I'm not even doing physical therapy, but it led me to get this job. So now I'm, I'm really Jason, like just basically climbing the corporate ladder. Um, I'm, you know, clinical director, kind of moving toward a director of operations role. So totally different. But now I feel like I kind of flipped to the other side of the spectrum. My work now is challenging. It's exciting. It's fulfilling. Um, you know, I like it. Like it's one of those, you know, you kind of go into work and you got a little bit of a, some butterflies, but I like that. I mean, um, you know, I, I wanted that, but now, you know, now we've got two young kids. My wife stays home with the kids and, um, she was ready for me to come home, you know, five, five 30. And no one else was leaving the office at that time. So kind of flipped to where it works good. Now it's not, it's not great for my family. So did that for a couple of years. Um, and it was, it was hard on us. Uh, I mean, you know, a lot of people have it a lot harder, but we just got to the point where we felt like this wasn't really the life design that God called us to. Um, so, you know, it was kind of looking for a change and, and a uh, buddy of mine at, at the company that was helping me build, build the division within the company. Um, he handed me a real estate book and um, it was interesting. It was kind of a random book called the 16% solution, like about buying more delinquent mortgages and notes and stuff like that. And I was like, I don't want to do that, but, but this is interesting. This is a whole different world. Red rich dad, poor dad then, and, you know, just had the light bulb moment that a lot of people do. And what it, but what it was for me, Jason was like, okay, I, I want to work hard. I really enjoy working probably too much, but I want to be challenged at work. I want to be fulfilled by my work. I mean, I'm going to spend a lot of time doing it. So I want it to be something I enjoy, but I also want to be able to control it because I mean, my faith and my family truly are more important to me. So that's got to come first. So even though I like this job, I mean, if I didn't have a family, I would still be with that company. Um, it was a great company. I learned great things. They're on a rocket ship. They are still just doing so well. I could be doing very well if I was there, but family is more important. So um, 
I felt like reading Rich Dad Poor Dad and just uncovering real estate and just entrepreneurship in general. I'm like, I, I think I have an opportunity to have both. I think I can go and have a challenging, exciting, fulfilling career in real estate specifically, kind of being an entrepreneur, but also control my time if I'm kind of working for myself to where I can prioritize my, my faith and my family. And so in 2016, I left that job. I took about a 30% pay cut to go back to doing home health physical therapy. So I didn't just jump all in. I went back to doing home health, which for me meant steady job, but tons of flexibility, tons of margin to start a real estate side hustle. And so that's what I did. I left in 2016. It wasn't until like the fall of, and it was at the end of 2016. And then it was like the fall of 2017 that I really got going in real estate. But that's kind of my story of how and why I got into real estate. Yeah, that's, I mean, that probably resonates with a lot of people. It resonates very much with me as well. It's just, you kind of get into that, the trying to find the balance, right? And, and a lot of people yeah. say that there is no true work-life balance, but it's, it's work-life control. Like you said, you just want control of your time. And so it's like, you can find a, a good paying job, but you probably work a lot, right? It's like, there aren't a lot of really good paying jobs that are <laughs> low hours. And, you know, if sure. you're working for someone else, that's just not generally a thing. Or you can f find that sort of easy, you know, easy home life job type of thing, but but you may not make as much money. So it's just kind yeah. of like getting yeah. control of all of that being being sort of in charge. So I totally understand. I totally understand that sentiment of uh if you didn't have a family, you'd still be at that job because certainly uh, for me, yeah. family is, is sort of impacts virtually every decision I make at this point. So I, I, I totally get that. Um, so, well, let's, let's talk then about, so you, you, you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you sort of decided, yeah, this real estate entrepreneurial spirit. And, you, and I also uh, was maybe touch on this too, but the fact that you kind of stayed doing that home health thing to kind of make the transition. So let, would you tell us kind of about how that transition looked for you, what you did, you know, kind of to, to have your job and then kind of start what initially seems like a side hustle, but, but was your ultimate yeah. goal? Yeah, sure. Yeah, Jason. I mean, you know, I had a buddy that was already a full-time real estate investor. And so I, I met and had lunch with him when I was still, you know, at that corporate job, I'm the corporate ladder. And he's like, he said, Lee, can you do your job from home? You know, can you get it to where you have more flexibility so that you can start real estate? And the answer for me, Jason, was no, I, I just couldn't. It wasn't that type of job. I mean, they were all about being in the office, all about being in the office. Obviously, this was pre-COVID. Um, I think things have changed there a little bit, which, again, that's why I think it's kind of exciting because I would tell people the same thing. Like, if you want to get into real estate, well, how flexible is your job? Can you make it more flexible? And, you know, you'll hear people, I think it's, I think it's Michael Blanc, um, you know, that, that does a podcast. And, and he always says, you know, he'll talk to people that are like, oh, I want to get in real estate, I want to get in real estate. And then he talks to them a month later, and they just took a promotion. It's like, well, how bad do you want to get in if you just took a promotion that's going to require more time? So I just decided to go the other way. And, and I would just in, encourage people, if you really want to get in, kind of think of it that way, where don't take that promotion, maybe even take a demotion. Maybe I mean, that's kind of what I did. Like, right. I still had a steady job, but I took a job that I was, again, took a big pay cut but a job where I had a lot of margin. So if you can find that in your job, you know, that's kind of the best of both worlds where you can, I mean, if you have a family, especially like I can still support my family, but I've got enough margin to, to go and do this other thing. So yeah, um, you know, decided to do that. And, and what that looked like, Jason, I mean, first we just, we did a flip. Um, so again, I left at the end of 2016, by the fall of 2017, we bought a house in our town on an online auction and just kind of forced our way into it. I mean, you know, I don't, I, you know, quit like nine months ago, whatever, but I just, I could not wait any longer. Uh, we couldn't, I mean, real estate was hot back then. I mean, that's what's so crazy about this market is gosh, in 2016, 17, it felt like you couldn't find a good deal. And now all, everything was a good deal based on what's happened since right, in I hindsight. Mean, yeah. You should have bought everything. Uh, but back then, it, you know, stuff seemed crazy. So I finally just pushed my way in. It was one of those where like, you know, I told my wife, like, Hey, here's this house coming up on, on auction. Um, it was like one of those auction.com sites. And I'm like, I think this would be a good flip, you know, right down the road from us. Um, you know, my limit 60 grand and I bought it for 70 or something like that, you know, or <laughs> limit 70, bought it for 80. I just, I, I wanted it in so bad. And it was rough. I mean, a really rough flip. It took us nine months uh, to do. We got it in the fall of 2017, finished it in the, the spring of 2018. And 
you know, those last three months, you know, she came to me, my wife's like, Lee, look, you know, cause I was really trying to control it again, Jason, you know, my, my goal was like, Hey, this real estate is a, is a side hustle. It, it, that's the great thing about real estate. I'm selling this dream to my wife. Like we can do it whenever we want. There's no pressure. That's what's going to be so great about it. And so I would go out there in the mornings and, and sometimes I'd have a light day uh, because, you know, I just had to see the number of patients that they gave me and I could move them around. So it was, per, it was great for like the first six months. And then I was like, Lee, look, look at how much still needs to be done. And you want to have this done by May 1st, you know, like selling season, like the best time to sell April, May. Right. So I, you know, targeted whether it was April 1st or May 1st, I'm like, that's when we got it done. She's like, Look how many, look how much has is left to be done. And she's like, you got to be out there every weekend. Like we got to get this done. And because we were nervous about it, we were nervous about losing money. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so I went all in. So those last three months really were not what I, not the dream I sold my life on. And what's interesting is we did well. Um, you know, again, the market was good. We made good money. And honestly, what was kind of funny, and I, I feel like this was just like the perfect picture of like, I made the same amount that I lost in my pay cut going from the corp climbing the corporate ladder back to physical okay. therapy. So, you know, and, and the whole time I'm listening to podcasts like yours, Jason, where like, and I got guys speaking into me, guys and girls saying flipping is not investing. Flipping is just another job. And that it was just, it's exactly what it was for me because I took this pay cut and I went to a much easier job, but then I added a flip on top of that and made back the money. But I was super busy those last three months, right. just like I used to be with the corporate job. So yeah. it, it, there was just no difference. There, there was almost no benefit. Now, it's one of those things where I wouldn't change it because it got me into real estate. So we didn't do another flip. That, that was kind of the nice thing is, is because I was educating myself before and during uh, listening to podcasts all the time. That's one of the great things about home health physical therapy. I'm driving around all the time. I can listen to stuff all day. So I just knew, and then, but I just needed to see it for myself. But really one flip was like, that's enough. This is not investing. This isn't the passive income, residual income that I, the dream that I sold my wife on. Right. This is not it. So um, I'm not going to do that again. Um, so we, we, we jumped into a duplex next and basically flipped that, but we, we rented it for a little bit and we, we were the landlords and, and got to experience that. But, you know, again, because it, it was vacant when we bought it, we got it, you know, got a good deal on it. We, we totally rehabbed it, got renters in and only rented it for a few months before we sold it. I mean, we sold it under a year. So it was, it was basically another flip, but we got to see what investing looks like. We got to see the income from our two renters be more than our expenses and make money every month. And even though we sold it, we saw like, as long as we own this, we're going to make money. I mean, sure. You could have vacancy that kills you, but those people weren't moving. I mean, I drive by today. It's been a few years and the same people live there. Um, cause it's, it's just a nice duplex in a nice area, a nice town. And so anyway, we got to see that this is investing and we wanted to do that more than that. So, um, I'll, I'll take a break here, but then we started moving into multifamily cause we saw like, this is what we want to get into. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, it's a, it's a fairly common path, right? People think mm -hmm. because I don't, I don't know if it's because of HGTV or what, but it's like yeah. flipping is, is what, you know, almost gets glamorized, right? You see like these show and they're like, yep we made $300,000 on this, you know, one flip in four months. And people were like, that's amazing. That's what I should do. And, but it's, it's really not all it's cracked up to be in, in terms of, it's definitely not the passive lifestyle that you no. were really aiming no. at and what you were trying to, <laughs> what you told your wife with the, the future yeah. looked like. It's, it's you're, you're just trading time for money. You don't make any money unless you're now if you build a team and you got a company okay then then right, you've right. built a business right but if you're just i mean i spent a ton of time out there i was out there all i i put in over 500 hours i kept track and i because i wanted to see now i and basically jason i made like 60 bucks an hour and and so that's good that's fine that's a that's a little bit more than i was making as a physical therapist at the time um so it, you know it was worth it and again it got me into real estate but i, I didn't want to do more of it that's not that's not investing yeah. it's not that scalable. I didn't want to build a flipping business. So yeah. Yeah. did you, did you have a, I mean, were you doing a lot of the work yourself? Do you have a construction background? How did you kind I of just have a little bit, my dad's in construction. So okay. I learned enough from my dad. And then when I was in undergrad in the summers, I would always do residential construction. Gotcha. So okay. I knew enough. So I can't knew, do, yeah. I can't do serious electrical, serious plumbing. I don't trust myself to do that. I could do it and figure it out, but we hired out pretty much all the hard stuff. Um, but I mean, I hung drywall throughout the entire you know, it was only a thousand sixty-four square foot house, so it was really small. But I hung drywall the entire time, every ceiling, every wall, yeah. the entire house, and then I had somebody else finish it. But 
I did. Yeah, I'll, I'll never do that again. But I, I did a lot of work. It, it was. Yeah. I've done. <laughs> I'm just laughing because I I've done that stuff too, and it's like, man, I hope you had a lift. That's all. I did. Oh, <laughs> hang, yeah. hang no, I did. I did bring a buddy out to help me, but no, we did not use a lift. It, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> No, I, I, I know it well. I've, I've done that some, a few times. Sure. Um, so you did the flip. You realized that was more, you know, sort of transactional. Unless, like you said, you, you know, people that build a true business out of it and they have sort of a machine where they're, yeah. you know, doing, yep. you know, dozens, if not hundreds of houses a year, that, then you can actually sort of create a business out of it. And I would say it's, it's probably still not investing. No, it's a, it's no, a it's job. Not. It's a business. It's a business. It, Yep. It, but it's it, it is it's real estate and you're right you know you kind of got started you did something and yep. then you moved on to the duplex kind of saw what it was like to be a, a landlord so you're making that progression kind of I don't know that I mean I guess you could say it's that you know that step up or whatever I think yep. uh Brandon Turner talks about what's the stack the or stack. something like yes. that yeah, yeah. Where, where you yep. you know start with one and then two and then four and then um yep. so what what came next for you and was your firing questions at you but was your wife involved or this was like your thing and you're just kind of telling her this is how you know this is how we're gonna we're gonna make it we're gonna get free this way yeah she wasn't involved it, it, it was it was bad timing in the sense we had you know really young kids so like that first flip you know she would try to bring the kids out but my son was two um you know if you've had a two-year-old especially a son it, um <laughs> horrible right like I remember one time he came out and my wife, like, she wanted to be involved, but, you know, somebody's got to have the kids. And, and, and for us, most of the time, it was like me working her and the kids. And so we're sitting there talking, like, just, I'm like, hey, here's my ideas. And, and she's really good about design and stuff like that. And my son is just banging on something in the other room. And so finally, I go in there and he had tripped and fallen and the hammer fell like beside his head. So close call there. And I look and he was just banging on a paint can, like just d demolished the, the lid on the paint can. And then, you know, she had brought out lunch, like just brought out some fast food and he's eating his cheeseburger. And then he dropped it into a bucket of, of uh, grout water. So cheeseburger is yeah. gone. And then he, then he grabbed an outlet and, and shocked himself. So I was like, like, we're out of here. We're out. We're, we're done. You know, we tried, we tried. It doesn't work. Yeah. Um, so for the most part, she could not be involved. So for a while in our real estate journey, it was kind of me dragging her along. It, 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 it wasn't good timing. She's very risk adverse. Um, we just did a podcast episode that was kind of funny. My wife and I, it was, it was fun to do. I said, the title was like, what do you do when your wife identifies with the poor dad? Uh, because that's yeah. her. She's like, yeah. look, I, I get it. I get that some people think the rich dad path is better, but it is risky. Like it, it is there. Like, I don't want to do it. So um, it was kind of me dragging her along. Um, and, you know, one thing I'll say, Jason, is like with the duplex, it went really well. So we could have held on to that. We could have done more. But you just start doing math. And, and our goal, you know, is like a lot of people's to where the income from our rentals would be enough for me to quit my job, right? Like you want to build up that, right? That, that's right. The, like kind of Brandon Turner calls it level one financial independence. I mean, that's what we were looking for. And when, when you got a duplex, and again, the numbers were great. I mean, our cash on cash return was, was, was phenomenal. We bought it really well. You know, we, we were getting really good rents. But it's still just, I don't know, what we, maybe we were doing like 400 a month. Right. you know, which is great, like 200, maybe, maybe five, you know, 200, 250 per unit. That, that's awesome. It's great. But how many is it going to take? Like, I, I think, I think probably I figured out it was going to take 20 duplexes, you know, to really hit our number. And one, it's going to take a really long time. Two, I didn't want to own 20 duplexes. Um, Cause I'm not going to find 20 duplexes in my town. Like this one was, this was in my town. It's going to be all over. I don't want to own 20 duplexes all over. It's going to be hard. I don't want to manage it for property management. It's going to be hard. So it's probably going to be more expensive. And I just don't want to own 20 buildings like that. You know, for me, I've always said, you know, I want to own a thousand units, but I want to own it in 10 buildings, not a hundred. So that, that's why we moved on. So, um, you know, luckily I found a really good apartment focus group at our local uh, RIA, the RIA in Cincinnati had a really strong, a guy leading an apartment focus group. And I started to learn from him how to underwrite, you know, how to truly value uh, multifamily properties. And so I just started looking around on LoopNet, you know, where deals go to die. And I thought, this is where I'm going to be able to find one because I can't compete with all these other guys. What the brokers aren't going to sell to me. So I found something on LoopNet that was just like 20 minutes from my house, put in an offer. They countered. I stuck with my offer, got it accepted and got a 16 unit uh, that, that was like 20, 25 minutes from my house. And so that was the next one. Um, and then I'll just jump, jump ahead real quick. So 
um, I guess just, just follow my timeline because I, I, I want to give people an idea that like I've, I've come really far. I feel incredibly blessed um, by my journey, but it's one of those things. It's the exponential growth thing, Jason, where like it's really slow at first. So we got the flip in the fall of 2017. It wasn't until the fall of 2018 that we got the duplex. And then it wasn't until the fall of 2019 that we got the 16 unit. Yeah. But then finally things started kind of clicking. And, you know, we, we've mentioned some of these other guys that you and I listened to, obviously. Michael Blanc talks about the law of the first deal. And I really saw that when I really got into multifamily, not with the duplex, but when I got the 16 unit, the day I was closing on the 16 unit, again, this is the fall of 2019 now, I got an eight unit under contract. A buddy of mine from church who I'd been talking to about this this whole time, he'd been following my journey. He found it actually. And I was like, Offer full price right now. He knew that he knew the realtor. It was a residential realtor listing an eight unit. I said, call him and offer full price. That's a great because I'd underwritten so many deals. I was so I knew what a good yeah. deal was. That's the key. You've got to be, you know, you've got to know. And since I'd underwritten so many, so we got an eight unit under contract as well. The day we were closing on the 16 unit. And then it was like a month and a half later, we got a 10 unit. So kind of that fall, you know, I just did one unit and then did two units, and then we did 34 units uh, that next fall. And, and got all those. And I used third party management. Like I said, I, I, well, I don't know if I said this when I was managing the duplex, I did not like being a landlord. And again, that's another thing I, I knew I, I did not want to be a landlord. So I felt like in this, I think this is true. The bigger you go, the easier it is to, to get your properties managed and, and have even oh, better sure. management. I think yeah, for sure. once you get above a hundred units, you can typically have even better management. Someone's going to be on site, things like that. So yep. I knew I wanted to go bigger. So in that, uh, the fall of 2019, I got three small multis under under contract and, and got to manage and stuff like that. Yeah. And were those all local to you? You're, yeah, yeah, those are all pretty local. Uh, I live between Cincinnati and Dayton, Ohio, and those were like all outside of Dayton. So kind of all out in country, little hillbilly towns. Um, but yeah, all within a half an hour. Okay. okay. Yeah. I mean, I think that, that I'm, I'm glad you highlighted kind of the timeline. Cause I think what people, maybe what people see uh, you know, social media is obviously very powerful, but what people see yeah. is that when, you know, people they buy apartment complexes or whatever, you know, start getting into this large scale real estate investing, they see, you know, maybe the, the end result or pe people that are sort yes. of into their yep. journey. And yep. what, what doesn't get talked about a lot is, is that it does take a long time to get started. And like yeah. you mentioned, oh. you know, you're like one, you're, you're buying one deal a year or, it yep. might take you a year or two to get the first deal. And, and then, but then it does, it, it does pick up. It's like you yep. get, you know, it, and it happened for me too. It took a long time to get the first deal. And then the second deal came a month later, basically. It was like, yep. all of a sudden you're just, you're moving uh, quickly at that point. And so um, I, I, I really think it's easy to get discouraged in the beginning, right? So mm -hmm. you have to have something you have to believe in it you have to believe in yourself and you have to not give up so uh I, I just i love that you kind of brought that up because i do think it's a thing that when you, you talk to people that have are are far along in the journey you know they may have thousands of units yeah. it's that's probably not even that maybe don't remember that or it's not like it's not their focus anymore right like it's a you get a, at a different level at that point so it's kind of cool to, to remember how that beginning is and and for people that that want to get into it um absolutely so okay so you had you bought those you know sort of three deals in in close succession um but i know you've sort of done more since then so kind of maybe keep going there on the on the journey what happened next Lee? yeah so basically i took the whole next year and i'm still doing physical therapy at this point uh but i took the whole next year didn't buy anything from the fall of 2019 fall of tw uh 2020 um, didn't buy any. Well, we did do one other flip. Um, and that went much better. The kids were, you know, this is two years later now. So we got a six and a four year old. And so they were able to play out there and my wife could help me. So that was a lot more fun. And we'll, we'll probably flip again because, um, I really want to get my kids involved in this and, and yeah. teach them work ethic and stuff. And my, like I said, my wife's really good at design. So she kind of enjoys like the last 10 to 20% of it, right. um, and all that. And she can get out there and, and paint and stuff like that. So, um, we did, we threw a flip in there, but basically it took the whole next year and, and I acted like as the GC. So we, they, these were heavy value add projects. So I really spent a lot of time out there, even organizing, um, uh, you know, the, the contractors and stuff like that and being out there with them and, and bringing materials and stuff. Um, and, and probably, you know, too involved. I don't, I don't act like that anymore, but that, that's what I had the time for again, doing the home health physical therapy. So I had flexibility to be out there. So spent the whole next year and, and, and Jason, probably 
I, I like to give people numbers. This, this is not bragging at all. I mean, it's not a big number anyway, so I don't, couldn't be bragging. But if I would have held on to all 34 of those units, if I still had them all today, I don't have any of them. But if I'd held on to them, because I did joint ventures, because I bought them pretty, pretty cheap. Again, it was hot back then, but like time the market, right? Because it went crazy because yeah. of COVID. Um, so if I'd have held on to those 34 units, just owning them with one or two people each, just doing joint ventures, simple joint ventures, it probably would have given me like $30,000 a year uh, in, in income, you know, and would have been pretty passive. Cause like I said, put a ton of money into it, but then, then you're kind of done and, and the property right. management can pretty much handle it when, when you've kind of done everything. Um, and so that was probably like halfway to where we just to pay our expenses. That's not 60 grand is nothing exciting for us, even in the Midwest, you know, we mm-hmm. pretty, you know, um, low cost of living here, but 60 grand would have like covered our expenses. So we were like halfway there. Um, but I was at this point, I am so into real estate. I want to be doing this full time so badly. I'm so done with physical therapy. So I didn't want to wait to, to do that again. I didn't want to go find three more. And, and again, it, it's harder and harder to find stuff for a good deal now. So I decided to take uh, advantage of the, the equity that we had in, and take advantage of the market. And we sold all three of those. Uh, we sold two of them at the end of 2020. Uh, and, and the way I look at it, you know, a lot of people, a lot of really smart people say, you, you, you never, never sell anything, never sell anything. Well, I think there's a lot to that. Um, and, and sure, there's times I was like, I think today, like, man, 30 grand a year with those would, would be great if we still had that. And it'd probably be higher because rents have gone up. But we were able to take like six to eight years of cash flow and, and get it today. And there's something to be said for the velocity of money as well. You know, because we, if you take that today because the market went crazy and, and then you put it back in, you know, if you, then you can use your money and recycle your money and, and see the velocity of money. And, and there's really something to be said for that. Um, but it, for me, really, Jason, what it did, it was just allow me to quit because we didn't throw that money right back in. It's sitting in our savings account. And I, I hate that, but it's, it gave us a cushion for me to quit. So instead of saying, let's get to 60 grand where I can quit. It was like, let's get enough in our savings to where we have 60 grand times three or whatever to pay for our expenses for three years. So we haven't reached level one financial independence yet that we haven't, but I've got three years now to go do it full time to reach level one financial independence. So I just, I like to tell that part too, because I, I, I think it can be a good strategy if you've got you know, enough stuff to, to get some equity to give yourself a runway. Um, then, then maybe you can go all in. So that's what I did at the end of 2020. We had sold two. We sold the other one um, toward the beginning of 2021. So we sold all three of those and it gave us this cushion to where I could go full time. So I quit uh, being a physical therapist uh, early December of 2020. Um, so a little over a year now. And so then, and I partnered up with, with a guy actually that the one that handed me a real estate book back at that corporate job, he had left too. And so we partnered up. And so all of 2021, we're now syndicating a little bit bigger apartment buildings. Uh, we did a 45 unit last February, a 47 unit last June, and then a 96 unit in December. So we got 188 units in 2021 um, through syndication. So and that's what we're doing now. We're, we're going to you know, try to keep doing that. Nice. All local. Nice. It's all been local again, local. too. Yeah. All, everything is in Dayton. Awesome. Ohio. Awesome. And I, I mean, really great point about, you know, kind of the velocity of money and, and, and just the strategy, right? So it's like, yeah, some people say, oh, I, I wish I never sold anything. But I think usually those people have been incredibly successful and they're like, oh, I wish I hadn't sold those things. But it's not, it, it, it kind of doesn't make sense because, well, you sold them, but now you have like 10,000 units. Like it, does, it doesn't, you know what I mean? Like they yeah. say, oh, I wish I didn't. But at the time- well, I they started it, investing after 2008. Right. Like, sure. <laughs> right. But- right. I, I tell them like, yeah, but do you think people in the, it started in 05, 06, 07, wish they would have sold some stuff? Right. You know, right. it, it just, we right. haven't had, we haven't had a, a bear market in forever. So yeah. it's easy to say that today. Yeah, no, I, I actually got, I got really lucky and I sold the, the first house I bought uh, just that I lived in. I sold it in like 2007 or something like that, like right, right before yeah. the crash. I, I literally made like, I doubled the price of the house, like for, or no, <laughs> two and a half times what I bought the house for. And I was yeah. like, I'm happy I sold it. I don't, Yeah, I don't, right. I've looked, I've actually looked at, at uh, you know, like Zillow or whatever. And it says the value now is what I sold it for then. Like it hasn't Jeez. like, and I'm like, just now got back. Right. Yeah. It just got back to it. I'm like, 
this is this is great uh but aside but but i think that the point is a good one in that yeah sure if like if you had all the money in the world and all the time in the world to to sort of strategize then yes it would be great to hold things maybe forever but but that isn't always the strategy that works to get you to where you want to go so it's like you were able to turn those properties sell them make a good profit and now use that as you said to to really go full time into into bigger things right into bigger yeah. into syndications which which will allow you again to to grow even faster so yes. uh you said it perfectly with velocity the velocity of money the velocity of your time all of that goes together to create you know the next level right so you can yep yep you say oh maybe i haven't reached that first level of financial freedom or whatever but sort of you you know what i mean like it's all relative in terms of how you're using it maybe you're almost like banking that or you're you're using it as a uh you're you're using that money to allow you to actually skip the first level of financial freedom and go yes. to level two kind of like yep. that 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 sort of just with a goal in mind yep exactly yeah yeah because there's an opportunity cost for me of i felt like staying at as a physical therapist yeah I had limited time to to get it you know that's why you know in, in 2020 i i think part of why in 2020 i, I didn't buy anything you know i, I still had a full-time job um so having those three was enough whereas if i was doing it full-time i could have managed those three as a gc and been out trying to buy more stuff but i was right. you know doing physical therapy so there's an opportunity cost right right exactly um so what are your, I guess, what are your plans sort of going forward then? So are you're, you said 188 units, I think you're, uh, and you're now syndicating locally. What, what's your plan kind of going forward from there? Yeah. Um, it, it, my wife will tell you it changes, <laughs> it changes sometimes, <laughs> but, um, I, we, we do enjoy syndicating. We've, we've built a business, um, you know, and we have a good group of investors and, and, you know, we're kind of doing more and more. My wife is now helping me a lot. Um, like your question, you know, with how she's involved, uh, the, again, the kids are older and, and now they're in school. We, we do homeschooling, but we do a hybrid program. So they're in school all day on Tuesday and Thursday. So she works most of those days with me. And so she's doing like all of our marketing and my podcast and stuff like that. Um, so we're, we're trying to raise more money and, and trying to buy bigger uh, buildings. So, uh, like I mentioned last year, we got a 45, a 47 and a 96. And getting that 96, again, we just closed on in December, so it's still very new, but we're seeing what a lot of people talk about with economies of scale. We're seeing that, you know, we're still using a property management company kind of in, in the same way that people with, with single families do. We're like, we just pay them a fee. So we're not doing it like a lot of people do the bigger buildings where like you pay a salary for the people that are on site and then you just pay like a 4%. We're still just doing like that 8% and first month's rent and stuff like that, which is what we've always done. But that property management company has one girl that's dedicated to that property because it's big enough to have yeah. one person dedicated to it. So when my, my partner's more the asset manager, uh, so normally he calls in and talks to somebody in the office that is like kind of over all of their units. They have like 1,100, 1,200 units in Dayton. Um, but now he calls one girl and our 96 unit is like her baby. I mean, she is, she knows everything. She is all over it. So we're really seeing the benefits that, that a lot of people talk about and, and, and that scale and things like that. Um, so we would like to buy more 100 plus unit properties. Um, the problem with that, in, in my opinion, is you are competing with bigger money when you go bigger. Uh, you know, almost nobody <laughs> that has a lot. And when I talk about bigger money, I'm talking, you know, people that already own thousands of units, people, uh, insurance companies, family offices. I mean, big money um, that, that just doesn't need as big of a return, you know, for them, 5% return is great. 4% return is fine because it's in multifamily, which is so stable. So that's what they're looking for. So it's hard to compete with that because they're willing to pay more because they're willing to accept a lower, um, return than we are and our investors are. So that's, what's difficult. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. I mean, th those are the deals we're looking at and, and still there's not a lot of big players that want to invest in Dayton, Ohio. That's why we feel Kind of blessed to be in this market. It's not a it's not a great market. I mean, I'll tell you, Dayton is not growing. It's it's not a growing population. Um, it's not one of these exciting places where you know you can talk about Amazon or Facebook or Intel, you know, building you know their next big thing. It, it's just not. But it's stable, and 
getting in at a decent price, I mean, that, that means a lot to me because I, I am worried about a correction. I, I do think we've been at the top for a really long time. So we really want to buy for cash flow. And when you buy at a four cap, a, a three cap, like, you know, it, it seems like it, I don't know how you cash flow. So, you know, we're still able to get in at a good cap rate. Um, you know, we're still finding properties that um, what, what gives me comfort, Jason, is when the property we're buying, the, the, the average rent today isn't at today's market rent. That's what, because I, I could totally see rent stalling out and not growing. Maybe, maybe we do go into recession and rents don't grow. Maybe they come down a little bit. But, you know, that 96 unit, the average rent was 640. And we felt confident that market rent for those units would be 800. And now we're going to make them, we're going to make them nice. We're going to bring them up. And, and we've already seen the first one we did, we got 825. So that's been confirmed. But if, if rents come down, let's say, let's say instead of 825, they're down to 775. I mean, that would shock most people, right? Because rents have just gone up since 08, or at least since 10, 11, 12, just gone straight up. And especially here lately, they can come down. I mean, it can happen. We're still okay because the average was 640, going up to 775 is good. Now, will we hit all of our projections? No, because our projections say we're going to get to 800 and then eventually 825 in the next three years. And, and so maybe in three years from now, they, but that's where we're at. That, that's where I'm trying to buy for stability where I don't want to get in and say, hey, market rent's 800, the, the property's at 800, but three years from now, we know it's going to be 850. So that's our, that's our profit. That would, that worries me. And I, I think some people are doing that. So um, that, yeah, I kind of, I kind of got off on a tangent, but th that's our plan is just to continue buying, you know, hopefully 100 plus, we would still do a 50 unit uh, here in Dayton, uh, but we just want to buy, if we can, we'd like to buy more 100 plus unit properties uh, in Dayton, Cincinnati, the surrounding areas. We've got some other um, good markets, uh, even down in Indiana, Lexington, Louisville, um, Indy, uh, Columbus. We'd like to branch out to those. Now, if we do go out to another market, I, I would only do 100 plus. I would not buy a 40 unit in a market that we're not in because we feel very good about our property management company in Dayton. So anything we buy in Dayton, if we bought a 20 unit, okay, just hand it to them. You know, th they've got it. It's not like that buying a 20 unit in Indianapolis. Uh, but when you buy 100, you, you can start working with a regional property manager that can manage anywhere and, and you feel comfortable with them managing 100 plus units. So that, that's kind of the goal for this year is, is to continue uh, syndicating and hopefully go a little bit bigger. Yeah, I mean, there's some really great points there. I think your that, you know, sort of size of deal is something that gets talked a lot about, but mm -hmm. there's a couple of, there's some, I mean, and you kind of made all these points, but there's some really important things sort of on both sides of the coin, right? Like if you're the bigger deals, what's nice about them is, is you mentioned property management, right? So you're going to have dedicated staff on site once you get up close to a hundred or more. So that's, that's easy of the economies of scale, that sort of stuff. That's, that's sort of easy to understand. Um, one thing that I have realized is that actually closing a deal, like the, like the transaction process, right? It's going to be the same whether you're buying 40 units or 140 units, right? That Absolutely. transaction process is the same. You have to raise more capital. But aside from that, like everything else is the same. And so it's easier to buy 150 unit property than it is to buy 350 unit properties. Yes. Right. You 100%. end up at the same number of doors, but like the, the, the transaction, it actually may actually cost you less to buy the 150 unit because you're not going to pay legal fees three times. You, you know what I mean? Yep. So some of that stuff, and, and so you, it's easy to see once you start doing deals, why the big players go bigger and bigger, right? Because it's yeah. like, well, if I, if I know I can raise the capital, the rest of it's the same. And so it just gets kind of easier and easier to do that. So I think it's, it's the capital raising side of things that, that probably hold people back from, from thinking bigger and bigger. And and understandably so. I, I get that. I, yes. I, 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 it makes sense to me. Uh, capital raising, I think, is probably the hardest part of the whole thing. But the the point about your like buy, buying locally, right, is a, is a great one where you would say, hey, I would buy something smaller if it's in my local market because I already have that that presence, right? If you already got a team there, and I feel the same way. Like we're buying in Atlanta MSA, and we just bought two deals, and in that market, 
I would be willing to look at things that are smaller because I have a property management company. If it's close to what I've already got, they probably can just add it on. They don't have to add more staff. It's just like, hey, we, we go buy this one, you know, yep. and, and check on it. And so, so I feel the same way. But yeah, branching out to another market, I'm not going to start it. I'm not going to start again, right? I'm not going to start with the smaller deals and, and build up from there. It just doesn't, it kind of just doesn't make sense from a, you have to, you sometimes have to do it to get started, but it doesn't make sense yes. once you actually maybe understand the game. And it's like, you've got a trusted established property management company there locally for you. So then it's, it's a different situation than if you said, like you go to Indy, you've got to find a new property management company and put them in place. So yeah. uh, I, I think those are all really, really great points in terms of, of it's just what your strategy is. Yeah. Right? It's, it's, yeah. It's funny now, Jason, to your point, like when, you know, I think I was looking at like a 10 unit or a 20 unit the other day. And I'm like, the numbers work. And I was like, I don't even want to think about, I don't even want to open a bank account, like to have to do another bank account for just 20 units. You know, because for each property, right. you know, it's another loan and, and we'll always open up a new, you know, and, and that's the way you should do it. Like a new LLC and, and a bank yeah. account just for that property. And I'll look at, I'm like, it's not even worth doing. Like, you yeah. know, it's just, yeah. it's not worth it. Because you your point, like even when I had the 34 units and the three properties, I'm like, man, if I keep adding like this, like how many bank accounts am I going to have? Right. And it's a, you've got to manage yeah. all that. It you, gets you know, confusing. So, okay. Yeah, <laughs> really, so you're right. Like confusing. you would much rather have, one 150 unit property, one bank account, one LLC, one group of investors, then yep. 350 units. It, so yeah, th there's a lot. To, and, but again, you, you probably don't have to start there. You don't, you're probably not going to be able to start there back to our point about, you know, my story and how it's slow. You don't have to start there, but you're probably going to get to that point where you realize like, man, I don't want to yeah. do a hundred deals. Yeah. You just, yeah. And it's like, you know, you mentioned it back with your, with your first flip and your duplex and things. It's like, because I had this same thought process when I was originally, you know, sort of thinking about it. My first thought was, I'm going to rent or I'm going to buy single family and and burr them, right? I'm going to, yeah. you know, fix them yeah. up, rent them out kind of. And I was like, well, I'd have to buy, like, if I want to get to 100 units, I have to buy 100 houses. Yeah. Like, that's that sounds so daunting. Like, oh, also, sure. I mean, buying one apartment complex sounds daunting, but it's a whole lot less daunting, I think, than going through that process a hundred times if you can just buy a hundred units once. Absolutely. And yes. so I, I think, you know, there, there's a lot to be said for just kind of thinking about those scales and, and, and what involves, what's involved with the economy of scale and why people talk about that as being such a big benefit. Like it's, I think it's a really important yep. uh, strategy to have. Um, Lee, let me, Maybe let's switch gears a little bit and we'll go, go through some of the questions that I typically ask uh, all my guests. Sure. Um, the first one is related to the name of the show uh, being Know Your Why. Lee, what's your why? What, what drives you? What, what kind of pushes you towards uh, greater and greater success? Yeah, you know, it, it definitely goes to my, to my faith in, in, in Christ and, and wanting to honor him and, and glorify him and, and do kind of have like an eternal focus. And then my family, for sure. Um, wanting to control my time, like, like we've talked about, uh, wanting to find something, you know, where, uh, again, we homeschool. So usually in the morning, um, I mean, I often don't start work until eight 30 or nine, uh, in the morning. And, and I get up at, at least by five in the morning, but, um, I, I like to work out. So that, that's something I want to be able to control my time and, and have time to work out in the morning. I usually get to spend some time with my wife in the morning. And then I help homeschool in the morning, uh, three days a week. Um, so, I want to be able to do that. And then, you know, sometimes I'm upstairs eating lunch with my family and, and we eat dinner usually 4.30. And I'm eating dinner at 4.30. Now, I sometimes work in the morning before the kids get up. I sometimes have calls in the evening. Um, I, I almost always do work on Saturday and Sunday at some point, like when the, you know, it wouldn't just when it makes sense. So um, I, I guess I'm kind of getting ahead. A, a big part of my why, honestly, is I, I really enjoy working, but I want to control my time. So my why, what I love about um, real estate and what makes me just want to do it all the time is that I just love working, but, but like building something. I, I love just building um, kind of like this, this portfolio, this, this, um, this thing, this business. I like building it, but I want to be able to 
control my time and, and do it when I want to do it. Um, and, and that's, and I'm able to do that with real estate and it, it, it's been awesome. So um, I'm one of the, I'm kind of over motivated sometimes. Like I know when, you know, back playing sports, um, I was the type of guy, like I did not need to get pumped up. I was, I was too pumped up. I had to like okay. settle down. I played quarterback and you, you can't be too pumped up as a quarterback. You'll overthrow every pass. Right. So I'm kind of like that in work too. I don't really need extra motivation. I'm more like, I'm, I'm, I need somebody to help me like settle down and, and um, you know, stick to what's going on today uh, versus yeah. looking ahead. But yeah, my why is just, just that um, wanting to find fulfilling, exciting, challenging work, but also be able to control it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it makes, I mean, makes total sense. And I, <laughs> I think there's probably a lot of people uh, in real estate that we have that same, like, the energy, the energy, the, the, the drive is there. It's not yeah. something that you're like, oh, I really need to figure out how I'm going to, you know, <laughs> work yeah, hard today. It, just, yes, it right. sort of comes, comes naturally. It's, it's like, I said, it's more like, I need to figure out how to focus this mm -hmm. and use it to, to the best, yes. you know, it's like, and it, you brought up something that, that actually I think is um, maybe worth mentioning there. When you said, you know, I, I, I always do a little, you do work the nights on a little bit on the weekends, all of that. And I do the same thing. But I think one of the things that is really great about when we talked about scaling, like one of the benefits is you get to the point where it becomes a business and not just kind of that side hustle. And then you get to hire people to help you and yeah. you can, you can have them help with that focus, right? You're the vision, you're the drive, but like, I'm sure you're doing things right now that you don't need to be the one doing. Right. It's yes, like you can. Sure. And so you can get to that point where it's like, okay, you create this well-oiled machine. And now you say, and I, I want to do this too. Like my kids are, are two or three, two, my son just turned three. And then I have an eight month old daughter. And it's like, I want to flip houses with them too. I, I want to bring them like, I, I love like my son, I have a garage full of tools. Like my son loves to swing a hammer and smash it on thing. Like I totally <laughs> understand your story from before. It, it makes total yeah. sense. I want to do that stuff with them just for fun. Right? Oh like, yeah. And yeah. so then it's like, when you get to that point where you can create this, this business, that's, you know, you're overseeing, but it's, it's running itself. Now you, you, you free up even more of your time to do, you literally can pick and choose exactly what you want to do. So yes. it, it's a, it's yep. a, a cool space to, to, you know, think about being in. Um, Lee, tell us something about yourself that maybe isn't common knowledge, uh, a special skill, a hobby, something that, that maybe not everybody knows. Yeah, sure. Um, I grew up on a farm, uh, which is a little bit different, uh, from a lot of people. Uh, it wasn't like a real active farm, but we, we had some animals and um, my wife grew up in the city, but is, is a total farm gar girl at heart. So, um, you know, we have chickens, we have a pig. Uh, I did have bees until they, they flew away on me this winter. Um, and we want more of that. We, we want we want more animals. We love, um, you know, we love it for the kids. It, it's a yeah. really fun thing. Uh, they they on Tuesdays and Thursdays, you know, they leave pretty early for school. But on every other day. Um, week and weekend, they have to go out and, and collect the eggs and feed the pigs and feed the chickens and, and change the water out and stuff like that. And I, so I love that for them. Um, so I think that's a little bit different. And, and we, you know, wealth for me, Jason would be, uh, we have a, we have a small house. Um, I'd like to have a little bit bigger house, but what, what wealth really means to us is having more land. Um, so, yeah. you know, I, I dream of having a, a big farm uh, someday and it's just like everything else. I mean, it's super expensive. I'm sure you know, land is really expensive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. all over, at least the places everybody wants to live. Um, so we, we need to keep buying apartment buildings so we can right. uh, buy some land, but yeah, so it's some kind farm. of unique, not, not a lot of people <laughs> want to farm anymore, but what we'd love to have kind of like a, a mini, like a fake farm. I don't want to be a full-time farmer out in the tractor right. all the time, but I want to have animals and have fun with it. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I, I, we're, we live in the city, we live in Los Angeles. I, I don't, I don't think I'm actually allowed to have chickens, but that is actually <laughs> kind of like, I love fresh eggs. Like I just, yeah, I would love to be able to go out. We go to the farmer's market and get them now, but I like, I would love to be able to go out just with the kids and be like, all right, we're going to go get the eggs and, and have them for breakfast. Like that would be amazing. Yeah, so it's cool. uh, yeah, it's very cool. Um, Lee, what's the best way when people hear this to, to reach out to you uh, if they want to connect? Yeah. The best way is to jump on our website, threefold, R-E-I as in realestateinvesting.com. It's T-H-R-E-E-F-O-L-D. REI.com. Uh, if you jump on our website, you can, you know, you can sign up for our monthly newsletter so you can hear from us and, 
Um, you, you can give us your email and we'll reach out to you. I'll set up a call with you. We've got a free ebook there called Five Steps to Passive Income for the full-time dad. Uh, we're, we're real passionate about showing, um, we, we don't think everybody should, should quit their job and, and go all into real estate, but we do think people should get into real estate. And if you can just save up some money, you can put your money to work for you the way, you know, like Robert Kiyosaki talks about, you know, make, make your money work for you. And that, that's what we're passionate about helping people do is get your money to working for you. So, so that you have more options than just trading more time for more money. Because that does work. Usually if you take the promotion, you put in more time, you'll make more money. But what if you could make your money work for you and make more money that way so you don't have to give up more time? So uh, check that out. Um, you'll find me on Facebook and LinkedIn as well, just under Lee Yoder. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, final question, Lee. What, what advice would you give to someone that's you know kind of maybe a couple of years back in their journey uh, when you were getting started? What would you tell them to you know, kind of help them succeed, help, help motivate them. Yeah. I think the, the key Jason is like, you know, what you and I both hit on where um, you just got to know it takes time, especially if you want to get into multifamily, um, which, which I think you should, I, I think it's great. Um, it really takes time unless you want to do it passively. Then, then if you've got some money, but then it may take time to, to get your savings up to 25, $50,000. And, and you, you've got to, it takes time. Um, Rod Cleef, another guy I like, um, he says, you know, real estate's not a get rich quick scheme. It's a get very wealthy, like for sure, but over a long period of time scheme. And, and I totally agree with that. Uh, another book I'll throw out there, Jason, is The Compound Effect, uh, which just talks about how, you know, when, when you're uh, so many things and in, in, in real estate investing, I think in general, but certainly multifamily is this way where like, you're going to work for a really long time and feel like you're seeing no results because you haven't bought an apartment building yet. But then all of a sudden you do and you go from zero to 100 units overnight. Well, you didn't go from zero to 100 units in just one day, just because you had zero units in one day and 100. Like, it's the, the work you put in over the first year, right? Like a lot of times it might be a whole year before you get that 100 unit. But it's because you're underwriting deals, you're talking to brokers, you're raising money, you're doing all these things. You're actually having success. You're actually making progress, but you, it just not, didn't get paid off yet. So the compound effect says, you know, what's better having somebody hand you a million dollars or give you a penny and tell you they'll double the money they give you every day. You just can't imagine that getting a penny and then two pennies the next day and four pennies the next day and eight pennies the next day is ever going to catch up to a million dollars. But actually at the end of 30 days, it's like two and a half million. Yeah. But what the real key of that, it, it, what's amazing is after like 20 days, you're two thirds of the way there. You still only have like 1200 bucks or something. I mean, it's right. still <laughs> so small. Yeah. You're nowhere close to a million, but it's in those last 20 days. I mean, heck, it's in the last two days, you know, because on day, um, you know, three days. So you're like, you know, you're at, you're at 500,000, but then it's a million, then it's 2 million, then it's four, right? Like you, yeah. and that's really how it goes. And, and I think in entrepreneurship and in multifamily investing, it's really that way. So if you can stay patient um, and stick with it, it's consistency. You've got to be consistent. That's what the compound effect's all about is if you want to have compound interest, if you want to have that compound effect, You've got to stay consistent for a really long time. And if you look at people that have really made it, that's what they've done. They've stuck with it longer than anybody else was willing to stick with it. And they're the people that have success and, and you've, you've got to be able to do that. So um, that's why I think for me, Jason, you know, I don't feel like I learn quite as much from podcasts anymore because I, I do have a lot of experience, been doing it for a while, but it's still so helpful just to listen to people's stories and, and remind myself, okay, they've been at this for a decade, right? right. They, they right. have, they have 2000 yeah. units. I have 188. I feel like they're so, they've been at it for a decade. You know, I started, I, I haven't been at it for, for five years yet. I haven't been at multi multifamily for, for three years yet, you know, so right. it's helpful to remind yourself of that, to stay, yeah. stay motivated. For sure. For sure. Yeah. No, I, I mean, great point. The, the time, and, it, and I think that, that it takes time and, the, and be patient and consistent. Also, it applies to active or passive investing. Right. Yeah. Because oh, yeah. like I, I talk to investors all the time, you know, and it's like, you know, here's your, here's, you know, say you're just to make the numbers easier, your the deal minimum is a hundred thousand dollars, right? It's not, it's not always a hundred thousand dollars, but like say it is, and you're going to get an 8% pref return like throughout. So, so you're getting $8,000 in the year. That's not yeah. like nobody's no. retiring off that. Right. Nope. No, but if you, even if you do that once a year, right in 10 years, you're going to have like, over a million dollars, like of, or sorry, over a hundred thousand dollars of, of passive cash flow every year. And it's yeah. just going to continue to compound like that. And so it's like, you, you just have to, you have to start, right? You just yes. have to start, you have to start yeah. and you have to 
believe that it's going to, and it's like, it, it, it does take a little bit of work, whether, you know, if you're active, it, it takes a lot of work to, to get those deals. If you're passive, it takes work because you're saving up your money. You're using that, you know, you're, you're absolutely using your time to make money. You've got to maybe uh, cut expenses a little bit here and there to get that money to invest, but it, it 100% will be worth it in the end. Absolutely. Yeah. Like you just got to give it a little bit of time. It will work. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It works. Yeah. It yeah. works every time when you right. say it, when you do it right and you say consistent, it, it works. Yeah. yeah. That's, I mean, I, I think that, you know, that Rod Cleave quote about how it's, it's, it's a, not a get rich quick, but it's a get rich for sure scheme. And, and that's, that's true. It just takes time. Yeah. And if you don't stop, you'll, time. you'll get there. So yes. Uh, Awesome. I mean, awesome conversation, Lee. I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you for for everything you shared about your story. Um, it's been it's been really cool. Appreciate having you on the show. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me, Jason. I, I enjoyed it as well. Absolutely. All right. Well, have a great day, everyone. I'd like to show you why knowing your why is the start of your journey. Without a strong why, it can be so difficult to reach your maximum potential. My name is Dr. Jason Ballara, and every week I meet with real estate investors and mindset specialists that are taking action in order to build a life according to their own terms. We will break down what drives successful people and allows them to achieve at such a high level. If you are a professional wanting to break through, or simply someone that wants to hear an inspiring story, the Know Your Why podcast is made for you.